Good morning. Today's scripture lesson is taken from Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 22. Before that, let us pray together the prayer for illumination. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silent us in any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired well and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and self to put on your eyes, so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I will come and sit down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you, Brother Duane. Very warm welcome once again to all of you. Uh, do take out your sermon notes as we uh, continue in our series titled uh, Negators. Is it basically this series, we are talking about the things in our life, the habits or the attitudes in our life which negates the work of God in our lives. And very often, it negates God's work in us in order to try to grow us. And sometimes very often we see that we want to grow in Christ. We want to grow closer, we want to grow deeper, we want to grow, uh, grow, grow stronger in more maturity in our Christian faith. And we find that, you know, somehow there's something that's, that, that's negating our growth, something that is hindering our growth. And some of you will be wondering here, how do I know whether I'm being hindered or not? How do I know whether I'm growing or not growing? I've said this before and I'll just say it again, it's a very simple test. How are you doing compared to last year? Have you grown? Are you still struggling with the same sins that you're struggling with last year? Are you still struggling with the same bad habits that you used to have last year? Are you still struggling with the same weaknesses that you struggled with last year? Do you think you know more about God this year than you did last year? Do you think you have a closer walk relationship with God than you did to this year than you did last year? And if you just, I mean, just, just take those simple, just ask yourself those simple questions and you will know whether you are growing or not. And if you are not growing, could there be negators in your life? Could there be things in your life? I, I know you want to grow. All of us here, we want to grow, right? We want to grow. But yet, there's something that is hindering, something that is negating that growth in our lives. This morning, I'm going to talk about a major growth stopper, one of the biggest that is faced by almost all Christians at one point or another in their lives. They will go through this and there's none other than a spirit of complacency. But before that, let us go to God in prayer. A wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honor and all glory. And Lord, this morning, once again, we ask for your spirit to come and fill our midst, for your spirit to come and speak to us. Lord, we open our hearts to hear from you. Lord, speak to our hearts. Change us convict us. We surrender our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is complacency? I mean, we hear that word very often, right? But what exactly does it mean? I've been looking through at various definitions all over the, I mean, in various dictionaries, I think, and I come across, this, this, I find this the, the best description of what complacency is. In the Oxford Bridge, a Bridge Dictionary, it says this, you are too satisfied with yourself or with a situation that you do not feel that any change is necessary. That you're so satisfied with yourself, you're so comfortable, you're so satisfied that you say, 
no need to do anything else. Whatever happens doesn't matter. No, I don't need to change. Or in other words, it's like, you know, apa sajala, whatever. You know, in that kind of attitude, whatever. If anything happens, just whatever. You know, I'm just so comfortable. In fact, if you can change complacency with another word, that one word would be comfortable. When I'm just so comfortable, that's when I become complacent. And that's why Revelation 3.15, let me read to you again the passage that was read by our dear brother Duane. Uh, it was God, God was giving, Jesus was giving a message to the church in Laodicea. And this is what he said to them in tr- chapter 3 verse 15. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither ho- cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. You see, that is the picture of Comfort. You know, you are rich, you have acquired wealth, you are so comfortable in life. You are so satisfied with your station in life. You are so comfortable to the point that you think, I don't want anything to change. I don't want anything to get better. I don't want anything to get, I don't want anything to change. I'm just satisfied. I'm just so comfortable. You know, in the in this, it's just a sidetrack a bit. You know, when we all the time when we read this letter to the church of of, of Lodicea, it's a very common letter, and we read it and we talk about hot coal, hot coal, and a lot of times, you know, sometimes we grow up with this misunderstanding that hot means on fire, excited, passionate for God. Coal means couldn't care less, uh, cold-hearted, uh, disinterested about God, and God and, and hot and lukewarm is somewhere in between. But that doesn't work. That's not what the scripture is saying, you know. Because there's no way that God will actually say, I would rather you be either hot or cold if cold is a negative thing. There's no way that God will say, I'd rather you be cold. But if you, if you look back at the church in Laodicea, it's actually situated among three cities. Historically, you can go there and see it right now. I was there about two years ago. Beautiful place. The church of Laodicea is here. About uh, how many kilometers are uh? A few, few miles up, there's another city called Colosse. That's where you get the letter of Colossians, Colosse. In that city, it's a mountainous city. And so, there is very streams of water comes down from the city of Colosse. And those are mountain, mountainous city. They have ice cool mountain peaks. And so, the water that comes down is very cooling, very cool and refreshing. South, uh, somewhere in east uh, of the city of Laodicea, there's another city called Hierapolis. And that city is very famous for its hot springs. They have hot springs, water coming out, and they have a lot of hot springs all over the city in the mountain cliffs, tons of hot springs. And those hot springs are full of minerals. And in those days, it's believed to have healing properties. So people would travel from distance to come to Hierapolis to dip in the hot springs for skin diseases, for arthritis, and all sorts of things. They would go to Hierapolis. In between that two is Laodicea. And the two streams would come and they would meet at the city of Laodicea. And you would have cold and hot and they come in the centre, it becomes very lukewarm water. And so in the city of Laodicea, it's a big city, huge city, wonderful city, rich city, but they have one problem. Their water is disgusting because it is lukewarm. It is neither hot nor cold. It is full of minerals but it is not hot. And it's like, you, you, when you taste it, it's like, oh, you know, you, you drink cold water, it's like, ah, oh, refreshing. You know, I love drinking cold water early in the morning. It's just, ah, oh, refreshing. And some of you, you, it's like coffee. You all like hot coffee, right? You like to drink coffee, it must be really boiling hot and burn your tongue and then you, ah, it tastes so well. Or you can put ice in the coffee and it tastes so delicious. But what about lukewarm coffee? Yuck. Correct? Yuck. And you just want to spit it out of your mouth. And that's what Jesus meant. When he talked about the church of Laodicea, cold is refreshing, is wonderful. Hot is lovely, is wonderful. But you, lukewarm, pui, is disgusting. And that's the picture that Jesus is giving to the church in Laodicea. And that's why he says, you know, in 3.16, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And that's how, Jesus, and that's how we look like to Jesus. When we live in a spirit of complacency, when we are neither hot nor cold, when we are no longer excited and for Jesus, and when we are living in a spirit of complacency, God looks at you and what He sees is a disgusting, lukewarm cup of coffee. Just one taste, pui, disgusting. And that's how you and I look like. And that's why the book of Proverbs says in 132, it says, the complacency of fools will destroy them. 
The complacency of fools will destroy them. Why? Why is complacency so destructive? Especially in our spiritual good. Why is it so destructive? Which you write me in the first point in your notes is this. Complacency makes us lose the desire to improve. It makes us lose the desire to improve. Revelation 3.17, let me read again. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. I don't need anything. I don't need to improve. I don't need to learn. I don't need to grow. I don't need anything. And that's what complacency does. It, leaves, it, it, it squeezes out the desire for improvement. It squeezes out the desire for change. You see, friends, our Christian life is like a journey. It's always a journey. And we are, we are always moving towards a destination. And the Bible talks about our life as a race. Or it talks about our Christian life as a pilgrimage, a journey. Because we are always moving from the point where we are in life to the point where God wants us to be. It's always a journey. And in order to move in a journey, change is inevitable. Improvement is inevitable. There must be change and improvement. But the problem is, you know, we become so comfortable. And we just don't want to grow in Christ-likeness, to grow to be where we are supposed to be. And that's why sometimes I, 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 I'm sometimes very puzzled, you know, when Christians come up and ask, you know, why must I go for Bible study class? Why must I attend DG? Why must I do this or why must I do that? Why must I attend church every week? Why do I need all this? Simple. You need to grow. Especially, it's just a simple thing about growing, about learning more things about God. When you go to church or when you go to Bible study classes, what you are doing is you are learning, you are growing in knowledge, you are growing in your understanding of Christ. You know, it's like, in, it's like, our, it's like our life. When we, when, we were in, when we were young, we go to school, we learn a lot. How many of you still remember what you learned in school? Half the things you don't remember, right? Algebra, calculus, trigonometry, physics. How many of you remember that? I'm sure none of you do, most of you don't. All right, so you see, we learn a lot. We learn in primary school, we go to secondary school, we learn some more. And we go to, some of us go to college, go to university, we learn even more. And one thing we realize is that many of us, after we leave college or we leave Form 5, we stop learning. Somehow we thought, oh, I finished learning. That's it, I don't need to learn anymore. And that's why many of us, we never learn anything new after we, are, after we have graduated. We stop learning. But everybody in life, everybody who is successful in life will tell you clearly, will tell you plainly that in life, what separates the successes and the failures, those who do well and those who don't do well in life, is those who make learning a lifelong process. Those people who continue learning, Whatever profession you are in, you're always learning new things. Whether you're a doctor, lawyer, engineer, carpenter, whatever it is, you're always keeping abreast with new technology, with new things. You're always learning. And if you want to stay relevant, you want to stay uh, relevant in your career, you need to always learn. You need to always grow. And if that is so true for our physical lives, if that's so true for our career, how much more true is that when it comes to our relationship with God? When it comes to our personal life with God, how much more true is that? But many Christians, we stop learning anything after we finish Sunday school. We stop. We don't learn anymore once we finish Sunday school. And some of you say, hey, wait, but doesn't, doesn't God love me the way I am? I mean, I mean I, the Bible says, well, you know, God loves me as I am. It's not because I know more God, than God loves me. God loves me the way I am. Isn't that true? Listen to this carefully, friends. Yes, God loves you the way you are. But He loves you too much to let you stay that way. He loves you the way you are, just as you are. He loves you. But He loves you too much to let you stay that way. Okay? And so that's why God knows that the only way for you to reach the fullness of Christ, the fullness of God for you, is that you need to be on your journey. Okay? Let me give you an example. Uh, Douglas, come, 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 stand, stand here. Okay. Okay, imagine this is God's fullness of God's will for me, God's perfect plan for me. A uh, little bit taller and more handsome, lah. imagine that, lah, okay? All right, but this is God's will for me, all right? And so, if the, uh, this is where I am at life. And that is what God wants me to be. And God knows that if He wants my, mm, for His perfect plan to, for, to be fulfilled in me, I need to be moving in this journey towards Him. And so we are continuing, we are moving in our journey. 
But what happens most of the time is as I'm moving towards that perfect plan of God, that Christ-likeness that God has for me, that fullness of His will for me, sometimes as we go along in life, we get comfortable. I'm just so comfortable with where I am right now. And because I'm so comfortable with this station, I stop moving towards that. I still know there is that thing over there. I still know that is what God wants for me. But because I'm so comfortable here, I stop moving that way. I stop being changed to look more and more like that. I look like this, with all the beard and all the tummy and everything. He got smaller tummy, you know, so I, I, I don't look like that. But I need to change. Because I'm so comfortable, I stay here. That's why the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 16, 18, 18, and all of us seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed into that same image from one from glory to glory. We are being transformed. We are supposed to keep changing, keep transforming into this image day by day. But because I'm comfortable, I stay here, I no longer transform. And that's why it's so dangerous that we know that complacency is so dangerous because it keeps us here. And we don't want to do anything. We don't want to grow. And that's why Zephaniah 1.12 says, you know, the Lord will, uh, at, uh, at the same time, at the time I will search Jerusalem with lambs and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. You see, what complacency does is this. Even though I'm here, and I'm comfortable here, I'm not there, and we'll think, oh, I'm comfortable. God won't do anything. Lah. He won't punish me. He won't do anything. He won't nothing. In other words, what we're telling ourselves is, I think I've already attained that. I think where I am is good enough or is as good as that. So I don't need that anymore. Because this is as good as that already. Because I'm so comfortable here. I don't want anything more than this. This is bad, good enough. I, although that may be good, but this is as good. Is equally as good. I don't need that anymore. And it's what, but listen to what Paul says in Philippians 3, 12. He says, Not that I have already attained, nor am I perfected, but I press on that I may hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching towards those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. In other words, what Paul is saying, you know, I don't say that I've attained. You know, when Paul wrote this letter, when he wrote these words, he was in prison waiting death row. He was at the end of his life. And if no other apostle has done more work or more, has grown in more Christ-likeness than Paul, I don't know who else would have, who is closer in that. And despite all that, Paul is able to say, I have not yet attained. I'm nowhere near that. In fact, all that I've attained, all these are rubbish. I count them as rubbish because I've not yet attained that. And I don't look back anymore. I don't look at them. I don't see all those things that I've done. I don't care whether I've moved from here to here. I've moved a thousand miles away. I don't care. I mean, I started off there, but I don't care about all that. All I'm looking at is that. And I have not yet attained. Despite Paul, at the end of his life, he still says, I have not yet attained. But yet complacency makes us think, I've already attained. I'm already there. I'm already comfortable. So what do we do? So what do we do, Andrew? What do we do? What do we do? Well, would you write me the first thing in your notes is this. The first point, I mean the, the, first, uh, the next point is, you know, to get out of complacency, the one thing we need to start doing is we need to be aware of your shifting faith early on and recalibrate. You need to be aware of your shifting faith early on and recalibrate. You see, Revelation 3, 7, let me again, read again for you. It says, I am rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They didn't realize their true condition. They thought that they have atta attained. They thought they are so comfortable, they are so rich, they thought they are there but they didn't realize that they are actually poor, wretched, miserable, and blind. You know, the devil is defeated, but the devil is not dumb. The devil knows that he can't get you to deny your faith, that you won't just go into sin outright, or you won't just deny God and leave God outright. The devil knows we are too strong for that. And so what the devil does is this, he gets you to shift your faith. 
The devil knows that there's no way if I'm moving towards that direction. There's no way the devil can straight away make me poop, make a U-turn. The devil knows he can't do that to me because our faith are too strong. But the devil knows that if he can just get you to shift your faith slightly. So let's say if I'm walking towards this direction and the devil makes me shift my faith a little bit. And instead of going that way, I go slightly this way. And I'm still going in the general hemisphere of that direction. I'm still moving towards there, but it shifts a bit. And after a while, I realize it. I better go back. And then I realize something. Eh, when I took that slight detour, nothing happened. You know what the devil's greatest trick is this? That when we stray off a little, he doesn't bring condemnation. He doesn't bring consequences. He withholds consequences. Because that's the worst thing that will ever happen, is where the devil withholds consequences. You know why? Then I would think, eh, nothing happened, ma. So after a while, I will shift a little bit again. And this time I stay here, because nothing happened. And I keep walking towards the, the I'm still walking towards Christ, God's will for me, but just a little bit offset. Then after a while, I shift again. And I'm still walking close that way. After a while, I shift again. And I shift. And I shift. And I shift. And before I realize it, I may not even know it, because the shift is just so small. I thought I'm still going that way. My internal compass says it's that direction. But I'm actually walking this way, while my internal compass is pointing that way. And I don't even realize it. Thank you, Douglas, you can sit down. Okay? And that's what the devil does. That's what he does. He doesn't get you to deny your faith outright. He gets you to shift it, little by little. It's like the story they talk about boiling the frog. You know the story? You know, you put a frog in a hot water, you straight away jump out. But you put a frog in a, in a room temperature, and you start boiling that, that water, the frog won't realize it's getting hotter and hotter until it's boiled and cooked. And you can eat uh, 3K, uh, 3K, the 3K, car, the, 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 the frog legs. You know, you won't realize it. And that's what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to shift our faith little by little. And that's what happened when we stop trusting the Lord fully. Yeah, maybe last time I used to trust God 100%. But after a while, I shift my faith a bit. Yeah, I still trust God. But I begin to trust myself 2%. And I realized, you know, no harm, you know, I trust myself a bit. Instead of 100% on God, now I'm 2% on myself. After a while, I began to realize, I, maybe I trust myself a little bit more. I, I, instead, of, instead of everything, have to pray, everything, have to run to God, something so easy, I do myself. La. And we shift a little bit more. And as we go on in life and begin to realize, you know, ah, yeah, some of these things, I can do it. I have the talent, I have the skill. You know, why, why bother? It's not, not important. No, you know, I don't even have to seek God. I really know the wisdom that God has given me. I know the will. I don't even seek God. Let me shift a bit more. And slightly but surely we keep shifting and shifting and shifting our faith. You know, there's two conditions when our faith is ripe to be shifted. When it's most ripe to be shifted, there are two conditions. One is when we face calamity, when we are poor and we are facing calamity and disaster in our lives our faith tends to shift. But another worse condition is when things are just so good in our life, when things are just so perfect and so comfortable and we're doing so well. And in fact, someone once said this, the toughest test is not poverty, but prosperity. The toughest test is not poverty, but prosperity. And that's why Deuteronomy 8.11 says this, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, <clears throat> when you build fine houses and settle down, and when you herd, your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Look at, the, look at what it says here. Verse 14. It didn't say, and then your heart may become proud. Or and then your heart might possibly become proud. No. 
It says your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. In other words, what the Bible is saying is shifts happen. All these shifts, it happens. There's no way you will avoid it. There's no way you can, you can, you can avoid yourself, your hearts from shifting. It will happen. It must happen. It doesn't happen intentionally. You don't have to do anything for it to happen. It just happens. The shift just happens. You know, it's like factory equipment. You know? Those of you who are working in the manufacturing line, in the factory, you know that every time as you start do, uh, whatever it is, whether it be the punching machine or the stamping machine or the boiler or whatever equipment you have, over time, the equipment without fail will definitely shift in its reading. Instead of punching 2CM, 2CM holes, slowly but surely, the holes will get bigger and bigger. It will get 2.001. It will become 2.002, 2.003, and 2.0. You know, it will inevitably, it will shift. The readings will shift. And that's why in all factories, what we do is we always have to calibrate our equipments. After a, a while, we always have to recalibrate. It's like driving a car. You know, you all drive cars, right? All of you drive cars. Most of you drive cars. When you drive, you know that every time you're on the road, your tyres actually shifts. The tyres actually gets worn out. And so it actually shifts a little. But you don't realise it because you're just driving normal. As you keep driving and driving, it tears and wears and tears more, it shifts more and more. And before you realise, your car is out of alignment or your tyres are out of balancing because it shifts. And you only realise it when it shifts a lot and then you go bop, 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 then you realise something is wrong. But when the shift is big enough, but the small shifts, you don't realize. And that's what life is. And when it goes, bah, 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 what do you do to do? You need to bring it back to the shop to recalibrate, to rebalance the whole thing. Likewise, in our spiritual lives, we need to recognize these shifts. We need to be aware that we will shift, and we need to recognize when our hearts shift. It will shift, but you need to, the key is we need to recognize when it shifts and recalibrate back. Recalibrate back to where it should be. How do you do that? How do you recalibrate back? Well, friends, which you write in the second point there, the only way to ensure your hearts get recalibrated back is restore your intimacy with God. Restore your intimacy. Revelation 3.20 says this, and I will come in. Jesus is talking. That those who open the door to Him, I will come in and eat with Him and He with me. You know, it's like a nice dinner date. And God is saying, you know, I want to have a dinner date with you. I want to come in and eat with you and have a dinner date with you. You know, you don't have a dinner date with a stranger. You don't have a dinner date with somebody you hate. You don't have a dinner date with somebody you don't like. You have a dinner date with somebody you're close to. Someone you want to have intimacy with. Someone you want to have built a relationship with. And that's what the Bible talks about. You know, when we talk about our relationship, you know, God is longing for an intimate, a close relationship. A, a relationship that's just full of closeness. Not a superficial relationship. Not a long-distance relationship. No. But God, if you read the Bible over pages after pages, God is longing for an intimate relationship with His children. And that's why the Bible talks about our relationship with God as a husband and wife, as lovers. You know, that is the way the Bible describes our relationship. And that's what God is longing for. You know, many of us, we have a relationship with God. We still have a relationship. You are all seated here, you have a relationship. But many of us, it's a distant relationship. It's a long-distance relationship or a distant relationship. It's like me, you know, I have, I always tell, I always joke around. You know, I tried to do my family tree when I was a very young boy. And I did plot out my family tree on my father's side. And I realized that I'm related to half the Penang Island. There's so many people. And you can travel to Australia, you'll meet some relatives there. You travel to KL, you'll meet some relatives. You go to Thailand, you'll meet some relatives. All over you have somebody that's related somehow. But I have no idea who they are. I have no, I have no relationship. With, I mean, yeah, we have relation. But there's no relationship. There is no closeness. There is no intimacy. Likewise. Many of us, we have a relation with God. He's our relation, yes. But there's no close relationship goes on. And the same thing happens in all life, all aspects of life. Even when it comes to our own marriages, things like that happen. 
Husband and wife can lose that closeness. Even like, as, as we can lose our closeness and intimacy with God. Even husband and wife, we, we know we sometimes lose that closeness. We lose that intimacy. That's why someone once said this, that in the stages of marriage, before they are married, they are met for each other. In the first year of marriage, they were made for each other. After the 10th year of marriage, they are mad at each other. By the come the 20th year of marriage, they are mad because of each other. Or someone wants to put this this way. In the first year of marriage, the man speaks and the woman listens. In the second year of marriage, the woman speaks and the man listens. In the third year of marriage, they both speak and the neighbour listens. <laughs> we sometimes laugh at these jokes. But it, it, it tells a very underlying truth that very often in our lives, relationship tends to drift. As close as they are husband and wife, father and son, mother and daughter, yet relationships will start to drift. Even you can still be living in the same house. You can be seeing each other every day. Yet, your relationship will drift. You lose that intimacy. You lose that closeness. Something is missing. You know, you, you, your, your heart no longer beats so hard when you see that person anymore. You no longer feel that excitement that, oh, if I don't see that person whole day, every day, and every night, you're just thinking of that person. You know, somehow you lost that already, that intimacy, that closeness. You're still together. You still talk to each other. You still look at each other, but conversations are now more facts. And of the heart. Conversations are, no, are more factual things. You know, uh, what's for dinner? Oh, this is for dinner. What do you want to do today? Oh, you know, it becomes more factual. Can you please pick up the children and do this? Can you please do the laundry? Can you please buy this? It becomes more factual. And, it, and conversation degenerates. And we can see that it's no longer a closeness in the relationship. Likewise, in our relationship with God, you know, in, in, in those, our prayer life with God, our walk with God, we can still be talking to Him. We can still come to church and worship God, I love you. We can still pray, God, I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that. But it becomes more factual. And there's no longer that intimacy with God. And when we lose, you see, what, what causes us to lose this intimacy sometimes? is we get distracted with so many things. Because as life grows, we get distracted. We get distracted with our job, we get distracted with our spouse, with our children, with our family, with our career. We just get distracted and we allow things to enter our lives. And that's why another church in Revelation, God spoke the same thing to another church, the church of Ephesus. It says this in Revelation 2 to 2, 5, it says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. And that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience. And have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. This is a wonderful church. A church that is doing all the right things. That is doing everything correct. But yet, he says this in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you. That you have left your first love. You have left. You have forgotten that intimacy. You have forgotten that closeness. You still have your works. You still do all the things that are right. You still pray. You still do your quiet time. You still do your devotions every day. You still attend cell group. You still do all that. But that closeness is gone. That intimacy is gone. And it's why Jesus said in verse five, 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember. Recall the time when you were close to God. Recall the time when you have an intimacy with God. Many times I always talk about husband and wife, you know. It's, it's good for you, husband and wife, to always recall the time when you all are so intimate with each other. And probably it's before you had children, before you, it's within your first year of marriage or before you were married. Recall those days. Recall the time when you can just sit down with each other and talk about the clouds for one hour. Don't you have that time, friends? Husband, you remember those days? No, because your wife was doing all the talking and you're just listening. <laughs> but you remember those days? You can just talk about, the, talk about nothing for one hour. 
And nowadays, sometimes, you know, my wife and I, we go out, we sit down in a computer, and we want to just spend time talking, and then we realize, what to talk about? Ah? Don't talk about the children, don't know what to talk already. You know, because sometimes you lose that closeness. I mean, to recall back, remember once again from where you have fallen. And how do we do that? How do we restore that intimacy? How do we recall again? How do we build up that intimacy with God? Which is what I mean, the next part of the point is this. Spend quality time. Spend quality time with God. Psalms 84 verse 10. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Quality time. You see, friends, in order to, to safeguard your intimacy with God, you need to spend time with God. Same thing with any relationship, with your spouse or your children. You need to spend time. But not just time, you know, friends. Sometimes we spend a lot of time, but it does nothing. You need to spend not just time, but quality time. You can spend time together and do nothing. You know, it's like you can, you guys, you can spend six hours watching television together and not say a word to each other. I'm spending time together, but no relationship is being built. That day, my wife and I finally got a chance to go to the cinema. Like, we haven't been there for years. And we went there and we spent three hours watching a movie. Two hours plus. And we were also watching the movie with another hundred over people. Am I building relationship with them? Am I getting to know them better? I spent three hours with them. But there's nothing. Likewise. You know, sometimes I remember, you know, sometimes I come back and I'm just so tired, you know, and my daughter or my son will come and say, Daddy, Daddy, play with us, play with me, play with me. And I say, play with you. Uh. Never mind, la, we do other things. La. I, I, I play iPad, I play computer with you instead. La. Or I play, uh, we watch TV together. Then I'll be sitting down, come, come, you see all the CD? You want to watch this show or not? Don't want to. Then I look for another show. Look for this show, look for this show. And, I mean, try, I'm, and, and here I am, trying to encourage my girl to watch television so that I can skip playing with her. And after that, I was just trying to get her to watch something. And then I began, I began to realize, you know, she wants to build relationships. She wants to spend time with me. Quality time. Playing and build relationships. Yeah, I'm tired. But what am I doing? I'm, try- I'm, I'm, I'm not spending that time. I'm trying to avoid spending that time. And just watch TV. And hopefully that just because by spending six hours with her watching TV, I've built some relationship. No. We need to spend quality time. And likewise, in our relationship with God, you can be reading the Bible for one hour every day. You can pray and do your devotions for one hour every day. But yet, you may not be spending quality time with God. You may not be spending time where you pour out your heart to God, where you open up your lives to God, and where you have true, meaningful conversation with God. Sometimes we spend one hour with God, Lord, please bless this person, bless that person, kill that fellow, bless this fellow. You know, we pray, and our, con- and our relationship with God is only a deteriorated to a f- factual relationship. Do this for me and I will do this for you. It becomes like that. And we don't spend quality time just enjoying the presence of God, enjoying the love of God, just pouring out our hearts to God and building relationship with God. But friends, before you, in order to do that, in order to spend quality time, because you see, friends, why is it so important to, be, to spend intimate time with God, to build your closeness with God? It's because when you are close, when there is that intimacy with God, then you will recognize when your heart shifts. Because it's when you, in, that, in that closeness, God will speak to you when your heart shifts. But if you don't spend quality time and intimate time with God, and when you come to God with a superficial look, when your heart shifts 10 miles away, you will never realize it because you don't have that relationship. But when you have that intimacy with God, and you're that close to God, you know, when you are just so intimate with your, with your spouse, you know, you can come back and you can be smiling there, but your mind is just distracted because of something they will know. When, just because you can be smiling there and say everything is good, everything is well, but they will know if you have a bad day, if you had a bad heart, if you have a, something went wrong, they know. Likewise, when you're intimate with God, when your heart shifts a bit, you will know. You will recognize. The Holy Spirit will convict you. You will know. What you do about it is another story, but you will know. You will recognize your heart has shifted. But if you have no closeness, your heart can shift a hundred miles and you won't even realize a thing. But friends, in order to safeguard that intimacy, in order to spend quality time with God, which you write with me the last point, the third point is this, let the Holy Spirit's knock affect you deeply. 
Revelation 3.20, back to the church of Laodicea. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will dine with him. Friends, we need to allow our hearts to be affected by the Holy Spirit's knock. You know, in the, in, you know, in, in the New Testament days, one of the widespread diseases was leprosy. Leprosy is a disease that makes, your, that makes you lose all the nerve, the feelings in your hands, in your feet, in your face. You lose all the nerve. That your nerve no longer works. So you have no feelings. And so what happens to leprosy is, you know, you know why a lot of leprosy, they, they lose fingers and hands and ears and eyes? And one reason is because they no longer feel any pain. They don't feel anything. And so they may be doing, they may be chopping vegetables in the kitchen and they chop off their finger, they don't even realize it because they don't feel anything. They just keep chopping. And so because of that, people, they, they, they start losing parts of their bodies here and there because they don't feel anything anymore. Today, thank God we don't have leprosy in our midst. Anybody here suffer from leprosy? Nobody, right? But I think all of us, at one point or another, we suffer from leprosy of the heart. Where our heart has become so protected, so sanitized against the Word of God, that even though God may be banging at our door, we no longer feel anything. We no longer feel the pull in our heart. We no longer feel the tuck. And many times we can just hear the Word of God, whether it's by preaching the Word or by reading the Word. Whenever the Word of God comes, it just phew, flies over us. We don't allow it to affect us. Even when it comes and we feel the knock, we say, ayah, that's not for me, it must be for someone else. And we shove that knock away. We close our ears to the knock. Even though we know that God is speaking to us, yet we choose to ignore that knock. And we don't allow the Holy Spirit's knock to affect us deeply. We don't allow it to affect us. You know, the statistics in the churches, in churches today is, you know, they took a statistics in US. They say that many people in US say that my family is really important to me. Almost everybody would say that. But the average father in the US spends less than five minutes a day with his children. Many of us will say our health is very important to us. But in a 2005 report, Americans' obesity shows that 65% of all Americans are obese. And 33% of all Americans are morbidly obese. Are we materialistic? Everybody say, no, no, no. I'm not materialistic. Money has no control over me. In 2006, 76% 76% of Americans are in debt to credit card alone, not counting car and house loan. And 96% of all Americans will retire in financial hardship. Is God important to us? 95% of Americans say, yes, God is important. But yet, only 9% of Americans attend church. And out of that, only 2% are involved in any type of ministry. Yeah, we, we believe God, we follow God. Why did that happen? Because we don't allow our hearts to be affected. We harden our hearts. We build a wall around it. That even though we know that this is the word of God, He's speaking about my life, He's speaking about me, but yet we build that wall and we say, nah, it can't be. I think it's for that guy. I think it's for someone else. It can't be for me. Even right now, among us sitting here right now, some of you will be feeling that same thing right now. You'll be hearing the Word of God spoke to you. And you'll be hearing God's voice to you right now, knocking at your door. And yet you will say, nah, it can't be for me. It should be someone else. Or maybe we allow it to affect us for about five seconds. And after that, we just brush it away. We just brush it aside. Let the Word of God affect you. Let it affect you. If you're just sitting here and so comfortable with things right now, let the Word of God affect you. I just want to close with this story of a bunch of goose. There's a story told of this Canadian goose that was flying across the farmlands of Kansas one day. And for whatever reason, he got separated from his flock that is flying south for the winter. He got separated. 
And so he saw this beautiful farm. And he said, wow, there were other goose in this farm. And they were having a great time swimming around. Let me go and play with them for a while. And so he went down. He was playing with those goose. And as he was playing with those goose, he realized that this goose belongs to a farm. And the farmer would come and feed them food every day. And he said, wow, this is a nice life. This is a wonderful life. And as his, he saw his herd, his flock of geese flying overhead, honking and calling him back, he says, don't worry, later, later, I will catch you. Let me just enjoy some food here for a while. And he enjoyed it for a while. He thought he stayed for a day. A day became a week. A week became a month. And the whole winter he spent on that farm. After uh, when summer came, the geese were flying back up north. And he hears the honking of the geese and says, wow, I would love to fly up there with them again. But just let me enjoy this for a little while more. And so he stayed there and he enjoyed things a little while more. Next winter came and the geese were flying south again. He hears the honks. He looks up and he just looked down again and he continued eating. The following winter came. The goose flew overhead again. And this time, despite the honking, despite the noise they make, this Canadian goose never even looked up anymore. Likewise, friends, don't let the knock of the Holy Spirit become so dull that you never even hear it knock anymore. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God, Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And once again, Lord, we ask for your Spirit to come and speak to us, Lord. Lord, many times in our lives, we have become complacent. We become, we become too comfortable with our station in life, with our things in life. We become too comfortable. Forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to grow. Help us, Lord, to realize the true situation we are in. And help us, Lord, to hear you when you knock at our heart. Help us not to push it aside. Help us not to ignore it. But help us, Lord, to allow your word to affect us so that we can build that closeness with you once again. Lord, I just commit each and every one of us unto your hands. As your people come up later to the communion, Lord, even right now, wherever they're sitting, may you knock on the door of their hearts ever louder until they open their hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.